So again, today in Galatians 3, verses 1 through 14, we're going to see three things. We're going to see foolishness, faith, and freedom in Christ. And so let's take a look at the foolishness. Look at verse 1. This is an awesome verse. <laughs> Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. <laughs> now again, I'm pausing it there because we're not doing the whole chapter. I get to take my time a little bit today. But let me tell you what's so awesome about this. If you walked into church today, you're like, oh man, I can't wait for that nice, light, fluffy, fun word. The first verse, Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who has put you under a spell that you would act like this? <laughs> This is wild because this is the kind of word that I think a lot of pastors would say, man, I don't really want to preach that. That doesn't really put people in the seats. Paul says, I'm a good shepherd, not the good shepherd. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. We told that the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, and that's what Jesus did according to John 10, 11. Now, for Paul, he's an under-shepherd. He is a man that is coming to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. And he says, if you start to stray from that, I'm not going to pull any punches. Not because I hate you guys, but because as a loving father, I'm going to give you that rebuke that you need. And see, these are the things that we have to understand. By the end of this section, we're going to see Paul's desire is not to condemn them. It's to refine them and convict them and draw them back into the truth. And see, this whole letter so far, the first two chapters have been, man, I can't believe that you guys have even given way to this thing. I marvel that you so soon would turn away from the gospel to embrace legalism. You say, what is legalism? Let me just explain it as simply as this. When you start to believe that you need to do certain things to attain righteousness in God's eyes, and we will see through this section, there is nothing that you can do by obedience, <laughs> by law-keeping, that would justify you in the eyes of God. Amen? The just shall live by faith. Faith in the grace of God that is given us through Jesus Christ. And he says, man, you guys are acting foolish. And the word there in the Greek is aneatas. It means to be unwise and not perceiving something. See, Paul is saying, how can you be so unwise to depart from this beautiful, glorious gospel? To move over, do you not perceive that this is the truth? Do you not perceive how blessed you are to receive this wonderful grace from God? And remember, Paul came into this place, this region of Galatia. We had cities like Pisidian Antioch, Derbe, Lystra. We have Iconium. These places that we see in Acts 13 and 14, where Paul stubbornly risked his life <laughs> to go selflessly proclaim the gospel to these people. At one point, he's stoned to clinical death, and he gets back up and goes and proclaims the gospel to them. <laughs> he says, man, this is serious to me. I am willing to die for this message. And you guys embraced it, and we saw such great things happen. But now, he's basically doing exactly what he instructed Timothy, the younger pastor, what he would have to do sometimes. In 2 Timothy 4.2, Paul told Timothy, he said, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. See, Paul understood there was a time and place to say, man, you need to be corrected. The number one thing that we need, I, I believe, as believers, <laughs> after we've come to Jesus Christ, we need to be teachable and flexible, amen? Now, that does not mean flexible and teachable to garbage out from the world and false doctrines but flexible and teachable to realize, man, if I've erred, I need to be able to heed that rebuke that comes from a brother. I need to be able to heed the rebuke that comes from the reminders of the Word of God. Many people will close the Bible because they go, man, it's uncomfortable to read when I'm in sin. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> because that means the Holy Spirit is doing the work of trimming, of pruning, and cutting away the things that shouldn't be there. The Holy Spirit who convicts us, that is like a pulse for the believer, that you're still alive. <laughs> if you're not convicted about anything you're doing that is contrary to Scripture, you're in trouble. <laughs> but when you start to step into things that are out of bounds of Scripture, that are trespass, transgressions, there is a conviction that comes. And that's when people go, I don't like that. We need to be teachable. 
Because can I tell you, as you heed the rebuke, you heed correction, you're going to be made more like Jesus. Amen? That's the goal. We're Christians. <laughs> It's been said that that term can mean little Christ. Originally, the way they would say it is in a derogatory way when that, that term Christian was presented. Oh, look at the little Christ. <laughs> look at all these little Christ, these pretend imi like, like imitators. But then it was embraced as we are Christ-like. This should be what our heart desires, amen? And see, as we've moved away, according to this section in Galatia, they've moved away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They began to think that they themselves could live uprightly enough to where, sure, I was saved by Jesus, but man, now I have to do the work. I'm the one that is actually punching my ticket into eternity. We understand that is heretical on many levels. I'll give you the most basic one. When Jesus was upon the cross, he said, Tetelestai, paid in full. <laughs> Amen? He didn't say 99% Tetelestai. <laughs> He says, no, it is paid in full. But we will understand by the end of this section, there is a response that should come. <laughs> it's not this sloppy grace where we go, cool, if there's grace, I'll just continue to sin. Romans 6, 1 and 2 says, no, don't do that. <laughs> Certainly not. If we are now alive in Christ, we should no longer live to sin. But we are saved by grace. I have to stress that this morning. And then in verse, in verse 1, he continues to say again, he says, who's bewitched you? that you should not obey the truth. And he uses this cool word for bewitched. It's baskeno. It pertains to snake charming and witchcraft. <laughs> it's wild to me because Paul teaches them the truth. They embrace the truth. And then after Paul leaves, we know this was a trend. We read about this often, especially in Galatians. There were these men called the Judaizers. The Judaizers were these men that were Jewish men, and they would come into places in Gentile regions really anywhere Paul had preached, and said, hey, if you guys don't start following us, tithe to us, dress like us, act like us, and keep all the commands of the Jewish law, unless you do that, you're not really saved. And it would bring a yoke of bondage upon these new believers that didn't know better. And see, I don't know what kind of trips have been laid on you. Maybe it wasn't to follow the Jewish law. But I have had many people tell me, hey, if you continue to listen or watch or do certain things, now again, I'm talking about gray areas. Hear me out here. We understand what's black and white in Scripture, amen? If you're, black and white Scripture things are like, no, we don't do those anymore. But there are liberties in Jesus Christ. But you can both abuse those liberties or harm someone else by trying to clamp down those liberties that the Holy Spirit has not convicted them in. And see, these men came in and said, no, you need to be enslaved again to this law that makes you completely ready to come into heaven. If you don't have that, you're not going to go to heaven. If you failed and sinned according to the law, now, oh man, you got to get right and go make sacrifice? Hebrews 10.10 10 says, no, by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, sacrifice is done. Amen? Could you imagine, this is always a fun point, <laughs> could you imagine if we still had to do animal sacrifices for our sins? We wouldn't probably even be here today. We'd be so busy slitting throats of animals right now. That's a gross, you're like, that's graphic. Welcome to the Old Testament law. Samuel carried a sword on him as a priest because that's what he did. He was more of a butcher than anything because he had to take care to cover the sins of the people. Once a year, Day of Atonement. Let's atone for the people's sins. All of that is done with because it all pointed to Jesus Christ who has fulfilled it in every jot and tittle. Amen? <laughs> it is done. And so once we know that, it's like, man, how could you be under a spell of these Judaizers? But it's wicked. It's these false brethren, as he referred to them in Galatians 2. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11.3, he said, I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And it's funny, this word, like we said, it has to do with like snake charming like spells and witchcraft. Forgive me, this is a random reference. Jungle Book, the cartoon movie from Disney, okay? Yeah, I'm a real scholar. I'm referencing you know, Jungle Book right now. Um, there was this snake. I don't know the name of the snake. I don't know it that well, but there's a snake in the movie. What? Ka. Ka. Okay, there is a snake named Ka. Thank you, Disney fans. So Ka <laughs> comes and gets the main character Mowgli and wraps around him. And I remember Mowgli is just under the spell of that snake who has him hypnotized. <laughs> 
This is what I imagine <laughs> when the Judaizers come in and they say, you have to listen to us, and these poor new believers are just like, oh, hypnotized, because these guys are powerful. These guys look so fancy. They have their flowing robes, their Jewish law. They say that they're the elite. And see, it's wild because it made me think of that because, again, 2 Corinthians 11 talks about how the serpent deceived Eve. This is all serpent talk. <laughs> when the enemy comes and uses things to get you to stray from the truth of Jesus Christ, it's a work of the serpent. <laughs> it's a work of the enemy. I think Paul is purposely using these kinds of words that have to do with snake charming so that we would understand the wickedness that's involved here. And see, he marvels. He says, man, Jesus Christ was so clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Now, let's be clear. They're in Galatia. You know, years after Jesus has been crucified, he's not saying you guys literally saw Jesus upon the cross. Maybe there was someone there. I don't know. But what he is saying is you have been plastered. The message has been plastered before your eyes, is the word in the Greek. I have put the gospel of Jesus Christ that you have been saved by his work that has been made so clearly to you he says and it was portrayed so clearly because as you embraced it you experienced the power that comes in the gospel <laughs> the peace that surpasses all understanding according to Philippians 4 7 you have experienced the promises that man you now belong to Jesus and you're made a new creation as you put your faith in the grace of Jesus Christ <laughs> He says, I don't understand this. I have shown this to you. You've embraced it. I have told you, as Ephesians 2.8 says, no, I'm sorry, Ephesians 3.8, says, I preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you know what Paul is marveling at here? <laughs> this is a silly, silly illustration. Maybe not sillier than Jungle Book. I don't know. But here's the deal. <laughs> If you had won the lotto, don't play the lotto, but if you won the lotto, you would be like, hey, this is cool. I just won, I don't know, the $50 billion Super Bowl or whatever it's called. I don't know. I don't play it, but you know what it is. And he has the ticket and says, man, I won. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to rip this up and go back to the job I don't like working. Are you crazy? Don't rip that ticket up, right? You have the gospel of Jesus Christ that says you are made righteous in God's eyes by his work. This is the greatest thing you could ever be given. He says, it blows my mind. You're basically tearing that ticket up. Saying, I think I just want to work through my own works. Get in. And you know what's crazy about that? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> that is the worst thing you could possibly do is say, man, my church attendance, my service, my community uh, you know, impact, anything that I may do, that's what's making me right before God. No. Jesus Christ has made you right before God. <laughs> now you respond to that grace by not forsaking the, the fellowship of the brethren, as Hebrews 10 talks about. By going and serving in church, by going and being a, a light to this dark world in our community, as Matthew 5, 16 tells us to do. We respond to the grace, but we are not saved by our works. Amen? Important thing to drive home. Look at verses 2 through 4. We'll take a little bit of a chunk here. It says, This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So what Paul is now calling them to consider is when they receive the Holy Spirit, which 1 Corinthians 3.16 says that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we become the temple of God, Ephesians 1 tells us we receive the Holy Spirit that minute we believe that we have now been made a new creation in Jesus Christ according to 2 Corinthians 5.17. So he says, when you receive that Holy Spirit, did you receive that because you were such good little boys and girls who kept the Jewish law, Gentile Galatians? <laughs> of course not. They didn't even know the law was a thing that like, even related probably to the Gospel of Paul. Paul came and told them, Jesus Christ, he died for you. There is one true God, and he came in as the Son, Jesus Christ, and he died for you. And when you believe by faith, according to this gospel, you will receive the Holy Spirit. And it happened. He says, let me get this right. You believe that though you started by faith, that that was somehow like not good enough? That God did not approve of you just by the grace, by the faith? That now you believe you have to keep this law that these Judaizers, these false brethren, have brought in? 
And see, it shows that it didn't come through their law-keeping. It came by hearing the Word of God. And I'll remind you again, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the? Romans 10, 17. We do that verse often because so many people will tell you, the Word of God's good, but you need this thing. You need that thing. You need this deal. Can I tell you the amount of like, promotional emails I get from like, companies that exist just to sell products to churches? And when I say products, I mean like teaching series that are like, this is promised to boost your giving by 25%. This is promised to put 30% more people in your pews. It's like, what are we talking about? Teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen? Teach the Bible. <laughs> and it's amazing to me because people will embrace these things thinking this is the answer. It may not be legalism, but you're going around the source to get to the source that is the word of God. Just teach the word. <laughs> Why go to some middleman, to some other product? Just teach the word. And that's what Paul did. And just as Peter promised in Acts 2.38, he said, if you believe upon the name of the Lord, if you believe upon Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit fell upon all kinds of people. Some people were converted Gentiles. Some people were Jewish in that case. But we know that throughout Scripture, we see that in Acts 10.44, Peter witnessed for the first time when the Holy Spirit fell upon unconverted Gentiles at Cornelius' household. He said, it says, while Peter was still speaking the gospel, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. They didn't have to go to a catechism. I'm not speaking against a catechism. Let me be clear. It's good to train and know the things of Scripture. But if you believe, well, I'm not really totally saved until I have read the entire Bible, I would tell you, read the entire Bible. This is what we believe, amen? <laughs> Stand for it. But you know what's incredible to me? When I came to the Lord in all sincerity and all truth at the end of 2008, I had never read the Bible. I had read pieces here and there. I had gone to Christian high school, Christian, Christian colleges, but never read the Bible. When I sat down and started to read the Bible, it was amazing because I was like, wait, this is explaining why I'm feeling conviction on these things I think I can still do as a believer. <laughs> the manual was explaining what was happening because of the Holy Spirit, because I had believed upon the grace of God. Amen? This is the manual. <laughs> If you say, I don't understand, so many people have questions. Am I able to do this? What should I do in this instance? Do you know many of those answers <laughs> are plain and simply presented in Scripture, either in picture or in principle? And as you read it, oh man, the whole thing comes together. <laughs> and you start to realize who the Lord is that you serve. Because this word is not a revelation of who we are. It's a revelation of who the Lord is. Let me tell you what this book tells us about us. You want to know the revelation of you in this book? You're a sinner. <laughs> you need to be saved. Amen? Too many people go, I want to read the Bible for me. Look, it tells you what to do, but it is in response to the revelation of who God is. You need to know who God is to know how to live. Amen? As a believer, as a Christian, and these men, they put their trust in the gospel, and that's why Paul here, he says, are you so foolish? Again, that word, he could be saying, are you so lacking perception? You don't understand what, we've, what has happened here. He says, you began in the spirit, but you're trying to be made perfect in the flesh. That word perfect is interesting to me. I've been accused by many that I try to be a perfectionist in a lot of things. And I feel like when I fall short of that thing that I think is perfection, which is funny because it's not perfection in the eyes of God. I think it's perfection. That's just a pride issue that comes out. <laughs> when I fall short, oh man... And I'm not talking about sin. I just mean like just not doing as well as I thought I could do sometimes. Oh man, I get exhausted over that. I get condemned by the enemy in that. And we're told what that is, is I'm basically thinking, man, I need to make myself perfect for God to approve of me today. Now let me tell you, it is the Lord that is the author and finisher of our faith, according to Hebrews 12.2. But we want to respond to that by walking out, working out our salvation with fear and trembling. And that's where that perfection thing can get weird. We have to understand, we want to respond rightly in that right reverence. But man, can I just tell you, the Lord is the one that's going to make things right, amen? <laughs> you might have a weight upon your shoulders right now this morning. Because you said, man, I just didn't share the right way at, at, at work this week. I had those opportunities with my family and I don't think I said it quite right. Lord, I'm such a failure. Can I just tell you? 
The Lord has a way of planting seeds when you just open your mouth, even though you didn't think it went right. <laughs> Man, the Lord can water those things through others and the Holy Spirit will just make it take root. I share that this week because I will tell you, there are condemnations that come with ministry. There are opinions that come with ministry. <laughs> if you start listening to opinions and condemnation from the enemy, you're never going to do ministry well because you're always going to think you failed. But can I tell you the other, the other side of that is when you think you just hit a home run every time and you're so good, that's pride. <laughs> Man, you should be able to step away and go, Lord, I'm going to do my best, commit the rest. Lord, that your grace would complete it. And that's in the practical, but in salvation, it is the Lord. It is all the Lord. He says in uh, Galatians 5, 4, Paul says, You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. The key word there is attempt. If you're trying to make yourself right according to law keeping, again, doing like obedience. You think obedience is your ticket into heaven. Let me be clear. Obedience is the joy of the believer. Amen? It's good to walk in the things that the Lord has given us. It's what we are made to do. But if you start to think that it's because of what you're doing you're going there, <laughs> you've confused something here. But again, <laughs> if you think you get to do whatever you feel like, I think maybe Jesus is your Savior, but He's not your Lord. That's a scary spot because I'll tell you, He's not your Savior if He's not also your Lord. He's got to be both. Amen? Jesus needs to be Lord and Savior and you're no longer the Lord of your life. But when you realize how good your Lord is, you go, man, praise the Lord for grace that I would continue in it. And do you know when you start to add all these other things, it says in Galatians 5, 4, you've fallen from grace? Isn't the temptation, I don't know about for you guys, but for me, the temptation is that legalism, obedience, that is actually a step up from grace in my mind. Oh, man, I'm like a pro, man. I'm an MVP at this Christianity thing, right? Which is funny. That's right before the fall comes, right? <laughs> 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Take heed to him who thinks he stands, lest he fall. And then <laughs> you're thinking this. You're like, oh, man, I'm doing so great. The Lord would say, you've fallen from grace. You've fallen down into legalism. You didn't move up into legalism. Legalism and law keeping is a move away from grace. And we're going to see they're mutually exclusive. You either get to choose to be saved by grace or saved by works, and you can't be saved by works. Amen? This is what Paul is driving home because people had come into the church and said, if you don't keep everything perfectly, you're going to go to hell. Don't think that doesn't happen still today in the church. We have had experiences like that with people that have come in, attempted to infiltrate the church with things like this. And it's wild because it's either one of two things. They either, for false sake, they just want a, an audience to follow them. Or if they're sincere and they're just confused... They believe that grace will lead to people living in a sloppy way. See, that was my leaning into legalism for years, was, man, if I don't tell people how obedient they need to be, everyone's going to live recklessly. But can I tell you, when you're freed through the Lord Jesus Christ, all you want to do is love Him and be with Him. Be with His people. It doesn't mean that you walk in perfection, but man, when you stumble, you are quick to run and say, Lord, I confess my sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, according to 1 John 1, 9. Are we not just blessed by that this morning? <laughs> man, I don't want to be put back under the shackles of legalistic bondage. I want to abide in Jesus. And see, that word abide that Jesus uses in John 15, 5, he says, you abide in me, I abide in you, and you will bear much fruit. But without me, apart from me, trying to add to what I'm doing, uh -uh, you're not going to bear much fruit. <laughs> Can't do anything without me. But to abide in him, that means that you're breathing in the very life that source that is Jesus Christ. That he's the vine. He gives you what you need to produce the fruit. And man, it's such a blessed thing because abiding, when you abide in it, you desire it. <laughs> This is what you long for, is to be with Jesus, to walk in his words, to do the things that he's called us to do. And it reminds us that though we preach grace, we should respond to grace. Again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. The grace that saves us is a grace that changes us. And see, in James 2.17, it says thus also, if faith does not have works, that faith is dead. It doesn't mean you're saved by the fruits. You're saved by the faith that produces the fruits. But saving faith should produce fruits. Amen? <laughs> There's that balance there. You're not entering the kingdom because of the fruit. <laughs> and in verse 4, when he says, Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. He uses this word for suffered. Pasco. 
It means to undergo or endure something. Now, commentators can be split on this. They say, is he talking about suffering in a bad way? Or in their language, that word suffering could mean you just experience something. You can suffer good things in the Greek. I think that Paul is implying both. Because what he's saying is, have you not suffered tribulation and persecution already for Jesus? Why did you go through all that if you're just going to bail on it now? At least make it count for something. Continue. Don't give up the race. Does that make sense? <laughs> We know tribulation happened there. We said it. Paul got stoned to death in that region and was raised back to life of sorts. Clinically dead, goes back and preaches the gospel. Persecution was rampant. But also, have you experienced, have you not experienced such great things that now it's all in vain, you're going to walk away from it? It's wild to me because when you experience, when you taste and see that the Lord is good, what else is out there after that? <laughs> Everything else, my old pastor used to say, it's like cotton candy, right? It looks so big, fluffy, and bright, you put it in your mouth, you're like, where'd it go? Right? It just disappeared. That's sin. That's the world. It looks so tantalizing. You want to go get it, and then it's nothing. It's empty. But man, when you're in Jesus, the hope that you have in Him, <laughs> the peace that you have, the promises of eternity with Him, you go, man, why would I forsake this? Why would I leave this? The Holy Spirit had come upon them. They were walking in it. They knew these things. It was a blessed thing. That's why in 2 John 1.8, John, the Apostle Love, he writes, Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but that you may win a full reward. I think this is the key. The enemy, though he might not get you to completely abandon the Lord, he's going to try to do everything to get in your way. He's going to try to do everything to torment you. Remember, we're told in John 10.10 10, that the enemy, the thief, he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's the angle of the enemy. But you know what Jesus came to do according to John 10.10? 10? That he would give us life and life more abundantly. <laughs> Why would we forsake abundant life for these passing temporal things? That is the game of the enemy and really the game of legalism. That, man, you got to do these things now. This is how you're going to make yourself right. It's foolishness. You've been made right in Jesus. You should be able to walk in that newness of life, being covered and grown in the grace. Amen? So that's the foolishness. Look at the faith. Look at 5 through 7. It says, Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So in this section about faith, what Paul is doing is he's saying, man, Gentiles are absolutely justified by faith. And he asks this another rhetorical question, which means you can assume the answer. In verse 5, he says, He who supplies or furnishes or equips you with the Spirit... And works miracles among you. Does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? <laughs> now again, what he is saying is you've seen great miracles before your eyes, according to those that have preached the gospel. Guys like Paul have come into town, and I mean, again, I keep bringing it up, but the clinical dead thing is pretty wild, right? You get stoned to death, and then you stand back up and go, hey, I'm going to go into the city and preach the gospel again. <laughs> That's pretty crazy and miraculous, I feel like. You go through Acts and you find out that at one point, I mean, Peter's shadow is healing people, it says. That's pretty wild. That's unusual. It actually says that it's unusual when it talks about Paul's handkerchief in Acts at one point. His handkerchief, this piece of leather, is healing people as he prays over it. That's weird. Again, unusual, it says in the Bible. Don't buy prayer cloths from TBN and on the internet that they're going to heal you. Don't do that. These are unusual things. The point was... That, man, the Lord is working through these men who preach the gospel. There is power in this. And then to the Galatians, who used to be these pagan maniacs, you guys have received the Holy Spirit and you've become new creations. That is a miracle, amen? We, for, we like forego that miracle so often, we miss that miracle. <laughs> So many times I'm like, all right, Lord, if you could just like open the earth up and like come out and show me who you are. But he gave you salvation. <laughs> the moment that you believed and you felt that weight of your sin and shame come off your shoulders, that is miraculous, is it not? That he fills broken vessels like us with his spirit, according to 2 Corinthians 4, 7, to preach that glorious gospel. These are all things, he says, did you get that because you kept the law or because you heard the word of God? <laughs> 
It was not by the law. This is why it's a rhetorical question. Everyone understood that. But you see, in this case, what he's saying, he's saying, you can't let these men come in. These Judaizers come in and say, that's great that you started with faith in Jesus. But if you don't keep the law, there's no guarantees that you belong to him. That opposes Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Do you know what is our seal and guarantee in the Lord? Our, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. <laughs> Not the keeping of the law. But do you know what the Holy Spirit does in us? We're going to read about it in Galatians 5 in a couple weeks. Produces the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are things the law could never tell you to do. You know what the law told you to do? Don't kill somebody. That's what the law used to say. <laughs> now in the spirit, you know what it says? Go love your neighbor. You see what I mean? If you're busy loving your neighbor, you're not going to kill your neighbor. The law is actually going to be fulfilled as you live after the spirit. Amen? You receive the spirit that you could walk out the things of the Lord, but not because you must keep them for salvation. <laughs> I know this sounds like a broken record to some. You have to remember. You may have read Galatians 10 times. There are people in here that have never heard this message before. I don't know why. The Lord just told me to remind you of that. <laughs> I think that's important. Because so many times we tune this off like, oh man, this is basic 101 type stuff. We get so easily swayed away from the beautiful basics of the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> It has been said that the gospel is so simple that a child can understand it, but so deep that theologians will spend their life never understanding it. <laughs> Think about that. We need to continually grow in the word and remember how beautiful it is that we have been saved by grace through faith, according to Ephesians 2.8. And that not of ourselves. A gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That is a beautiful verse that we should just walk in, that we should remember forever. And he says, this is actually exactly what happened with Abraham. He brings up Genesis 15, 6 in verse 6. He says, just as Abraham believed the Lord and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Do you know what Paul's doing right here? He's saying, hey, you Judaizers, you guys that I used to be just like, remember Paul, the Hebrew of Hebrews at one time, Pharisee, man, a strict Pharisee. He says, I used to be just like these Judaizers. Worse, I used to try to destroy the church, not just preach at them. He says, you guys believe you're so zealous for the Jewish people? Abraham did not receive righteousness because of the law that you're saying these people must keep. He received it because of his faith. That is important. Do you know that that occurred? I just told you. That happened in Genesis 15, 6, when God says, that faith, I'm going to count it for righteousness. Do you know when circumcision, the beginning of the law, began? Genesis 17. It wasn't the law, and then faith came. It was faith came, and then chapters later, years later, it seems, we had circumcision in the law. <laughs> This is important because so many people will tell you, man, you can't just be saved by grace. You are absolutely saved by grace. <laughs> just like Abraham was. This is wild because the Jewish men who loved Abraham, they would be called out right here because the reality is they weren't doing the things that Abraham did. <laughs> Abraham believed in the promised word of God. And they were rejecting the promised word of God that Jesus is the Messiah and that faith in him is what will give you righteousness. They were saying, no, works. The law is what will do it. And their supposed father Abraham was justified not by what they were preaching, but by what Paul was now preaching. How radical is that? Paul, the guy that thought he was like, had all together when he was, you know, in the law as a Jewish man, he now preached accurately in Jesus the faith that saved Abraham. He had missed it in all of his studying of the law before that. We have talked about this often. It is a scary thing when people handle the word of God, but they don't find God in it. Do you know what that is? It's really a pride issue. God is always, the Lord is ready to reveal himself. He's long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish. 2 Peter 3, 9. But man will read the word and twist it in a way to make himself feel better about himself, to make himself the Savior, make himself the Lord, make himself the hero. And just like those religious leaders in John 5, 39, Jesus said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, but you were not willing to come to me that you may have life. 
You've studied it thinking you know the answers, but your pride has blinded you from coming in. That was the Judaizers. They weren't coming into the faith that saved, that was accounted as righteousness for Abraham. Paul said in Romans 4.10, he says, How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? He says, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. It didn't come because Abraham kept the law. It came because he believed on the Lord, but he later responded by walking in the things of the Lord. Amen? Faith, grace, response. <laughs> These are the things. The grace comes, the faith believes and receives it, and then you walk it out as a new creation in Jesus Christ. <laughs> in verse 7, he says, Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Do you know what he's saying about the Judaizers that claim to be these wonderful children of Abraham? He says, they're not even really children of Abraham. <laughs> they're children of the law of Abraham. But they aren't children of Abraham. In a spiritual sense, those that have put their trust in Jesus Christ, we have become the heirs to those promises, and we become spiritual children of Abraham in that sense. That is an awesome, incredible thing, and it's a tragic thing to think that those people that by lineage, by DNA, by nationality, these Judaizers, they did belong to Abraham in that sense. But they missed the most important part, which was the faith that Abraham had. And see, as we believe it, we're told in Romans 4.13, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If you want to be of the lineage of Abraham, man, you need to come all the way. And we call the Jewish people that believe upon Jesus a completed Jew, right? Complete. They are incomplete until they come into the faith. And we as Gentiles have been grafted in to that beautiful promise that was given there. We didn't replace, amen? We've been grafted in. There's still a beautiful, lovely plan for the Jewish people as his covenanted people. So again, why we stand with Israel. We believe that the Lord is going to have a great revival there according to Romans uh, 11, 26. We know that that's going to take place, but we have been so blessed by coming into the family of God by believing the promises that were given to Abraham. <laughs> and see, it's interesting because it says, Abraham believed the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Let me tell you what it doesn't say. Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Let me tell you what this means. So many people today, if you went out and said, is there a God, you know what they would say? Oh, I believe there's a God. Well, who is he? Oh, I don't know. I believe he's there. I mean, I look around. You know, most of our nation actually are not atheists. They believe in some kind of God. And many of them profess this empty, watered-down Christian God of the Bible. They go, I believe in God. I somewhat believe the Bible. Do you believe in his word that he is to be submitted to, yielded to, that you would trust him with your life? Have you believed in him? Oh, I believe that he exists, but I haven't believed in him. See, we're talking about a trust issue, amen? Let me give you, this is funny, this is a pastor story. You know what a pastor story is? A story that many preachers will tell, and no one's real sure if it was true, it just preaches really good. But I did the research, I actually did the research. There was a man, a French tightrope walker, you're like, where are we going? Hear me out. A French tightrope walker named Charles Blondin. In 1859, he said, I'm going to tightrope walk across Niagara Falls, over Niagara Falls. And he was like a showman. He said, I'm going to put this thing, I think it was 160 feet above the falls, and it stretched 1,000 or 1,100 feet across. And he says, I'm going to walk across this tightrope. And to drum up attention, he first got up there, and he kind of wobbled across it. Everyone's like, what is that guy doing? Right? He gets everyone's attention. But then he walks across it, no problem. Everyone's cheering him on. He's a showman. He's getting all everyone worked up. He brings a chair out. He sits on the chair, and he's juggling on the chair on the tightrope. Everyone's just losing their mind. He says, one last thing, he pulls this, unveils this wheelbarrow. <laughs> and he says, I'm going to walk this. Who thinks I can walk this across the rope? Yeah, we all think you can do it. He goes, all right, watch this. Walks it across the rope. Everyone's like, this is awesome. Who thinks I can do it again? Yeah, we think so. All right, get in. Someone get in. <laughs> no, I'm not getting in the wheelbarrow. Are you crazy? I don't trust you. I believe that you exist and you did that. I'm not getting in, though. This is the difference between believing in God and believing God. Abraham believed God that, man, if I put my son, if I slay my son, he will have to raise him up because he has promised something to me through that lineage. The world says, I believe in a God, but I'm not trusting him with my life. 
You see, we have to understand that Judaizers believed in God, but they didn't know God. They didn't trust the Lord. They didn't trust in Jesus Christ. This, I will tell you simply, get in the wheelbarrow, amen? <laughs> trust the Lord. As shocking, as terrifying as that may be, know that he's faithful. He's better than some French tightrope walker, right? <laughs> he's the Lord. He's worthy of your trust. And I will tell you, in Genesis 17, 4, there was a promise to Abraham. It said, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. This shows that you're not just the father of Jewish people and people have to become Jewish to experience those promises. That means that your promises will be given to even Gentile nations as they believe with the same faith as you, Abraham. Amen? Trust in the Lord. Look at verse 8 and 9. It says, And the scripture, therefore seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. And I'm going to hit that quickly because we know what we're talking about at this point. We've hit this many times, but I have to stress this. I love how Paul always goes to scripture to prove his points. Paul doesn't say, hey, listen to me because I'm so well-spoken, which Paul said he wasn't well-spoken. I love that about Paul. He's like, man, I wasn't this great orator that people were like, oh, man, I want to hear Paul speak. They're like, that guy? I love that. I appreciate that. <laughs> and Paul says, I'm going to use the scriptures to show you this. And he quotes Genesis 12, 3 to show that God always promised that he would justify the Gentile nations through those promises that he gave to Father Abraham. He says, in you, all the nations shall be blessed. <laughs> and see, this is cool because it says that God called his shot before it ever happened. We're talking about Genesis 12, people. Like, really, way back at the beginning of your Bible. And Paul's over here on this side in the New Testament saying that God knew that he would make a way for justification. That you would be deemed righteous in the eyes of God through his son, Jesus Christ. And you say, how do we know that? <laughs> Well, there's so many places, but the big one that always sticks with me is Isaiah 49.6. The Lord is promising through Isaiah the, the, the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah would come, and he says, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you shall be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That was 700 and something years before Jesus was born. He says, you, the Messiah, the one that comes, he's also going to be salvation for all men that put their trust in him. Amen? This is what he's stressing here. He says, God always called his shot on this. He says, therefore, you have to believe to be justified. It doesn't come by keeping the law. Again, so many people get hung up on this. If I don't teach obedience, obedience, obedience every single study, people are going to go get sloppy. Can I tell you what that is? That is me not trusting the Word of God and the Spirit of God to do what he has promised. <laughs> Do you know that when you believe in the Lord Jesus, I'm going to say it again, you become a new creation according to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Do you know why you become a new creation? Because <laughs> flesh and blood cannot in inherit the kingdom of God. You need to be born again just as Jesus said in John 3.3. 3. Unless a man or any person, <laughs> unless any person believes and is born again, they will not enter the kingdom of God. Jesus with his own mouth said that and Jesus went on to say, for God so loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. These are the things that Jesus expressed in Nicodemus, a religious man that no doubt, undoubtedly strived to keep the law. Jesus was preaching the same thing. Until you're born again, that stuff's doing nothing. That stuff, it won't even justify you after you're born again. Justification comes by faith. Take a look at verse 10 through 12. We're going to see the freedom that's here. It says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse for it. For it is written, and he quotes Deuteronomy 27, 26, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For, and he quotes Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. And that's a quote from Leviticus 18.5. <laughs> so we're almost done. Remember, we're only going to verse 14, so hang with me for a minute. In this section, I love this because what Paul is doing is he's taking Old Testament scripture 
to explain this New Testament principle of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something that's happened even within Calvary Chapel in the last, I don't know, five to ten years? There has been a conversation that says the Old Testament is not relevant to teach on Sunday mornings. <laughs> that is garbage. That is not true. <laughs> I use the word garbage, forgive me. I, I don't know what else to call it. Rubbish, maybe that sounds fancier, more, more Paul-like. It's, 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 it's dumb that anyone would say, we don't need the Old Testament, it's passe. Paul, as a writer of the New Testament, could have said, you know what, I'm just going to write new things and just say new things, and it's of the Lord. No, he supported everything with Scripture. <laughs> he supported it with the Old Testament and showed that God speaks through the Old to explain the things of the New. I think one of the best practices we can do in teaching is when we have a New Testament principle, use an Old Testament picture. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is unchanging according to Hebrews 13.8. Man, continue to study the whole counsel of Scripture. But what Paul is doing here, he says, look it, if you try to come under the law, do you know what the law brings? A curse. <laughs> you want to live under the law? Good luck. That's what Paul's saying. He says, let me explain to you that there is no way you're going to be able to do this because Deuteronomy 27, 26 says, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things that are written in the book of the law to do them. <laughs> James explains this really well in James 2.10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. <laughs> Have you ever heard someone say, like, well, it's not like I killed someone, right? Okay, I'm not a murderer. Okay, but did you like, get a speeding ticket? Well, yeah, then you broke the law and you're a lawbreaker. Well, no, but that's so much worse. No, if you break any part of it, you've broken the whole thing. And see, this is what the law says. If you fall short, and can I tell you who's fallen short according to Romans 3.23? Everyone, right? We've all fallen short. This is why what he's saying here, he says no one is going to be justified by the law on the sight of God, he says in verse 11. Even if you could, which by the way, you can't, even if you could, do you know that's not how you're justified before God? He says no, Habakkuk 2.4 says, the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4 is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Habakkuk is this small little minor prophet, three chapters. You could flip a page in your Bible and probably miss it if you were going fast enough. And that one little verse is a proof text that is used in Galatians here, in Romans 1.17 for Paul to explain that you are saved by faith and grace. And then in Hebrews, three of the heaviest, most doctrinal books of the Bible quote that one little verse from Habakkuk 2.4. The just, those who are justified, they're justified by faith. Hebrews 10, 38, it says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, moves away, my soul, God says, has no pleasure in him. Paul said in uh, Galatians 2, 21, If you believe that you need to keep the law, then Christ died in vain. You have moved away. You've fallen from grace. You who preach legalism. And he says in verse 12, yet the law is not of faith. That's a wild statement, is it not? If you told someone the law of God is not of faith, they'd be like, that's a weird statement. It comes from the book all about faith, right? What he's saying is if you try to be saved and justified by the law, <laughs> you're no longer being saved and justified by grace, by faith. The two are mutually exclusive. And when man believes that he can save himself by works, do you know what he's going to have? A curse. But when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, man, the freedom, <laughs> the beautiful freedom of that bondage that comes off you, as Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. <laughs> are you just weighed down? <laughs> with condemnation, just fear that you're not doing it perfectly enough. <laughs> I don't know about you. I had a week like that last week. And I'm not talking about sin stuff. I'm just talking about ministry where that can get so heavy. You're just like, man, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And that's not what I said, but that's what the enemy wants you to do. It's funny. I, I wasn't going to quote him today, but I'm going to quote my man, David Guzik. Sorry. So I was at a pastor's conference one time and he was teaching and he said, you know what the enemy loves to do? He loves to try to convict you. You're just the worst. You can't serve in ministry. Look how terrible you are. And he says, you know what? That's it. Before, and he says, this was happening right before he was going to teach at a pastor's conference. As he's sitting in the pew about to teach. He says, I'm going to teach the most lights out, powerful, passionate study ever because I'm never doing this again. And he goes up there and teaches and he's like, 
you know, the Lord just works this great thing. He's like, all right, fine, I'll do it one more time. And he says, he's been doing it one more time for like 35 years now. And this is the battle that the enemy wants to cripple you with. Don't think that like this guy on stage has, it. oh man, I'm just coasting. There is something that you need to understand. Everyone that walks with Jesus has a bullseye on their back now. And if he can't get you with like the tricks and the traps of temporal things, he will get you with condemnation. That is his hope. That man, you're so, you're so useless. Don't do the things the Lord has called you to. Just give up. Man, Satan loves a Christian that's in neutral. <laughs> you're not moving forward. You might not go on backward, but you're just sitting there. And I'll tell you, if you're in neutral, you're eventually going to roll backward. <laughs> Be making progress in the Lord. Amen? This is encouragement to remind you that if the Lord is encouraging you and convicting you, praise the Lord for that. Run towards it. But if the enemy is condemning you, remember there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, according to Romans 8.1. Amen? Look at verses 13 and 14. This is where we finish today. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, quotes Deuteronomy 21.23, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. I had to pause here today, because again, I want to take my time in this section. Next week we'll talk about the purpose of the law, but this week was, man, you got to be careful. If you start to think that your works, that your behavior, and I'm not talking about sin, I'm talking about conduct and thinking, man, I didn't do enough. I'm not living rightly enough. Oh man, you're just stressed about these things thinking that your eternity is on the line with those things? And I tell you, that, that's scary because that makes us just like many cults at that point. There are many cults and religions that say if you don't do enough good things, God's sending you to hell. That is not the gospel of the Bible. <laughs> the gospel of the Bible is that Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law because he became a curse for us. No other holy book says that God put on flesh and died for man, and now we just have to believe to receive it. Every other holy book says you got to do something, and if you don't, you're going to hell. You know what you do here? You have to believe. And you say, wait a minute, that sounds like a work. Not according to Romans 3.27. There's works and there's faith. There's two separate laws. The work of faith, it's not a work. It is the stopping of work. Stop resisting and start believing. Yield to the Lord. You can take no credit outside of the fact you just stopped resisting. That's not a work to just lay down and let the Lord just have his way and yield to him. But when you're actively fighting against him, you won't know the blessing that Jesus has paid it all upon that tree, upon that cross. But can I explain to you what, what Paul's saying? He says, undoubtedly, Jesus Christ became a curse because it said in Deuteronomy 21, 3, curse is everyone who hangs upon a tree. Jesus took that instrument of death, the cross, the crucifixion. He made it a pathway of life and freedom for the believer. <laughs> Amen? Why do we celebrate the birth of Jesus every year? Because it's not just about his birth, it's about his death. If Jesus comes and does not die for our sins, we're all going to hell. But when he came, it gave way to the promise that he would fulfill the things of the Messiah and that he would be a light to even the Gentile nations and bring salvation to everyone who believes. And that should remind us that we have been freed from the condemnation of the law, the curse of the law, but this is an important word how we end today. He redeemed us. Do you know what it is to be redeemed? You no longer have to wear the prison clothes. <laughs> you no longer have to wear the shackles. You're no longer a slave to this world, a slave to sin, a slave to fear, a slave to all that garbage. You have been freed and redeemed by Jesus. Now let's respond to it, amen? <laughs> Do you know Titus 2.14? It says, Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. <laughs> We're not saved by our works, but our faith produces works. <laughs> And it's so glorious to walk in the very thing you were created for, according to Ephesians 2.10. We are God's workmanship. Poema in the Greek, this beautiful artwork. When we walk in those good works that he prepared beforehand. I'm not telling you not to do the things that God tells us to do. Do those things, but don't think that's your ticket into eternity. 
you are responding to Jesus Christ offering upon the cross who he died for anyone and everyone if they're willing to come in by faith. But do not let that be a message of universalism. You have to stop resisting. You have to put your trust in the Lord. Believe his promised word that Jesus is who he says he is. And when you confess at your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Romans 10, 9 says you will be saved. Amen? Amen. Salvation does not come through law keeping. Salvation comes to, through believing that you are unable to keep the law, but you need a savior in Jesus Christ to save you from it. And he has redeemed us. I will tell you, this morning, we now can know the blessing of Abraham, that we can be accounted as righteous in God's eyes, and that has nothing to do with your works. I said it yesterday. I said to a friend, anything bad that happens in my life, that's on me. <laughs> anything good, that's the Lord by grace. <laughs> Salvation is not just good. It's the best thing you'll ever know. <laughs> and I have no business saying that because of me. Is simply resi stop resisting, believe upon the Lord, believe his word, and step in to eternity. Amen? Amen. Why don't you guys stand with me? We'll pray.